Shalom. Welcome to the Way of Messiah Fellowship. We are a husband and wife team walking in the Hebraic roots of faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We desire to bring you teachings that are biblically based, not sensationally based, and we hope to make some sense out of some nonsense as well. Sound doctrine is what the body of Messiah needs at this hour to build us all up in faith, maturity, and unity. Thank you for joining us as we follow Yeshua, our Jewish Messiah and King. He is our greatest hope, our strength, peace, and joy in all areas of life on this short side of eternity. It's an exciting journey, digging deeper into Scripture to discover hidden gems that God longs for us to find. We look forward to hearing from you, so please feel free to give us a thumbs up or comment below. You can also send us an email at twmfellowship at gmail.com. Blessings and shalom, y'all, from our home to yours. Well, Shabbat shalom to everybody. Shabbat shalom online. We're glad to have everybody here. It's great to kind of be back. Uh, Michael and I were talking. I know it's only been, I checked, it's actually only been two weeks, but it definitely felt like a month. Yes. A lot of that may have been because, you know, we closed down the men's Bible study here also, which is kind of a bummer until January. But it's good to have everybody back here. We're hoping that uh, more folks will join us online. Eventually, I was just, we were just telling Michael, our subscription base online on YouTube is growing. And if we get 100 people subscribed on YouTube, then we can start streaming live on YouTube, which will really be cool, I think, because, you know, we won't just stream that, record it. Do some as soon as we get more technicians in the house. Right, right. As soon as we get more technicians. So. Or I we, get paid. That's right. So with that. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We magnify you. Thank you for your Sabbath, this day of rest, this day when we can breathe out the world and breathe you in and just spend time with you. We thank you for this week's study, sir, and for the words that, uh, that we'll look into. Father, as always, we just ask that it be less of me and more of you. May each heart, each house represented here today be fertile soil for not my words, but the words in scripture that we look at. We lift up all those who are not with us today. Father, we ask you to protect them, watch over them. If there is sickness, we ask for healing. If there is depression, we ask for encouragement. If there is discouragement, we ask for joy. Father, we just ask you to embrace all those who are not with us and any of those who are in a bad way as we meet today because of the situation this nation is in and the restrictions that are on so many people. We bless you and magnify you, sir. We know that you have not left the throne and that none of this escapes your attention and none of it caught you by surprise. Now, as we move forward, we ask you to inhabit this place, inhabit the homes of those who have joined us online and those who will join us through the YouTube video. Again, we bless you and magnify you, sir. We place these petitions at your feet in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. 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 This next year is going to be a teaching time. We're certainly going to do the Torah portions and continue doing those, but we're also going to just going to do some general teaching. For example, I've been asked, why is it when we're doing the Shema, when we get here, that we do this, the, the bent leg, the bow? That's traditional in the synagogues and was in the temple, as far as we know, when one was acknowledging God himself as the king. Because if you go and stand before the queen of England, you're going to bow. Well, how much more so for the king of the universe? And the whole, the, the knee thing is because we are told to worship him with all of our heart, mind, strength, and understanding, all of our strength. And so the understanding is, is this way, you're worshiping him with your whole body. And when you see pictures of the, uh, of the Western Wall and you see the, uh, 
right? You see the Jews there that are praying and they're and they're doing this is called davening, and that's praying with their whole self. So when we do this, when we get to the Shema, just remember we we are acknowledging that He is the King of the universe. There are no others. So that's why we do that. Just wanted to toss that out there, and we'll be doing more of that as the year goes by. People have questions. Why do we do this? How, why do we say this? Why is why is why is what we do here different than what takes place tomorrow? And why do we do that difference? And so we're going to cover those things as the year goes on. So happy new year or not. So we're starting right here. On the whole idea about yesterday being a new year. It all depends on whose calendar you're looking at. That doesn't make it a bad thing. It's just, again, I'm a firm believer in let's just make sure we get our facts straight because that's how the church as a whole has wandered off into some things. There are people who actually celebrate yesterday as some sort of holy day on God's calendar, and it is not. And we just need to understand that. Actually, the the idea of yesterday being the start of the year, I think it was Pope Leo that began that. That's not a slam on the Catholic Church. It's just that that's just historic. That's just the deal. They were looking to set a standard time frame, you know, standard dates and, and all that sort of thing. And they, again, understanding that Jesus was born on the 25th of December, which he wasn't, but that's another story. So they identified yesterday, the 1st of January, as a part of that incarnation celebration. And so that January 1st would just become their new year. God's year doesn't start until Passover, until 14 days actually before Passover. Yeah, 14 days before Passover, which is the first day of the month the biblical month of Abib, which is traditionally known as the sun. We'll get into all that further down the road. So anyway, we want to wish, we want everybody to, to have a healthy and happy and prosperous year ahead. This was just an opportunity for us to just kind of toss out that information about what yesterday actually represents. And that brings us to, I'm going to say, there's no S in there. Probably should be for words because make sure you got something to write with. We're going to look at some different words. But our, word, our first word of the week also happens to be the title of our Torah portion for this week. And it's Vayahi. I don't know if y'all can see that online or not. But... You've been paying attention. Frank, you out there? He's checking here. I'm going to get Frank to help me because remember, we talked about words that are set up like this before. That this is actually three words. It's actually a sentence. It means, and he lived. Frank, help us out. How is this, how is this three words? The Vav is, a, is and, the Yod is masculine plural or masculine singular, he, and the last two, the Het and the Yod is he, which is life. Yep. And then, so the word we're looking at this time, thanks, Frank. That's great. The word we're looking at this time is Chaya. That's our actual word of the week is Chaya. So what happens is, is that the, whoa. That's what you say to a horse, isn't it? I know, right? The the word, because of the way Hebrew is, and I'm going to be teaching y'all some more Hebrew information too. The way Hebrew is, the the subject of the word can, or the, the, the primary verb, can get lost in the sentence because of the way that Hebrew is written. If you didn't understand this to be chayah as the verb in the word you wouldn't get it you wouldn't be able to see it because it's hidden in there and that happens frequently and later 
in the year, we'll look at why words get hidden like that. I'm not going to try to teach you a college level Hebrew course, but I think it's important that we be able to at least identify some things in the original language in case you find yourself looking at the Hebrew, you'll be able to at least identify a couple of things. So the word Hayah, that's the root word, it's a verb. It means to live, figuratively or, or literally. That's that's basically it. But given the way Hebrew is, there's more depth to it than that. It also means to revive, to keep alive, to give life, to restore or be whole. So that's Hayah means all of that. And it can be used in any of those particular applications. I would recommend that you kind of keep that in mind because when we get to or near the end of our study for today, this information is going to come back to us. So, haya, to live, literally or figuratively. John is alive and he has lived a few years. And he will continue to live, hopefully, robustly, because he will be restored according to the promises of God. Who says in Psalm that he restores our health, our strength, and our youth every day. I'll take that. Wow, Amen. You you sign me up. Okay, so this week's Torah portion, I told you, this was our word of the week. And so... Frank just read a portion of it. Our whole core portion is Genesis 47, 28 through 50, 26, which means we're closing out the book of Genesis or the book of Bereshit this week. And for those of you that have been paying attention, there's an event that takes place when we close out the book, and we'll be doing that later. Our half Torah portion, part of which John read, 1 Kings 2, 1 through 12. And then our apostolic writings, Hebrews 11, 21 and 22 is a part of it. And then Michael read the other portion, which is 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Again, a reminder, we had the Torah portion for the, for the whole week, and we study that here on Shabbat. But the encouragement is, if you have one of these cards, read the Torah portion throughout the week so that when we get here, I can look at Diane and she can give feedback in. She can give us her insights into what the word says. That's what makes this a midrash, which means a discussion. All right, so our, our Torah portion overview. Here we go. Don't bury me here. Right, read that. There's adoption. Mixing up the pecking order. Consequences. Jacob dies. Mercy's demonstrated. Don't bury me here. And then Joseph dies. That's our Torah portion, basically. Our Hoth Torah, David admonishes Solomon to keep the Torah. David dies, Solomon becomes king, part of what John read. Our apostolic writings, I'm going to focus pretty much on what Michael was reading. The first thing in Hebrews is how Jacob and Joseph are in what we call the Hall of Faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. But the big thing, what Michael was reading, was Peter's exhortation for us to remain faithful. It's easy to, well, probably not for y'all, but for me, sometimes it's easy to forget that I'm supposed to be a man of faith when things start happening that don't line up with my agenda. Instead of trying to figure out what his agenda is and falling in line with that. So we're going to look at that a little later. But first, let's spend some time in Genesis 48. I did not put all the scriptures up here because hopefully you have your Bible handy where you can just get to it. We want to look at something eventually. Remember, as we look at Genesis 30, 48, Joseph was the favorite. He was the favorite son. That's part of what got him in trouble with his brothers. So he didn't know how to handle being the favorite son. However, he had to wait for that favored status to be realized. The same is true with us. We effectively are the apple of God's eye. John, did you realize that? You are the apple of the eye of the king of the universe. Duh. <laughs> 
But we have to wait for that sonship, that adoption, to be realized. Even though we walk in that now, we won't see the reality of it, as Michael read, until we have arrived at the other side, as it were. We talk about adoption, and we're going to go to Genesis 48 now. And we're going to look at verse 5. Jacob is speaking. <clears throat> Joseph heard that his dad's about to die. And there's about to be a change in status going on here. And let's back up to verse 4. Jacob is talking about how God appeared to him. And Jacob says, And he, Adonai, said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people. And will give this land to their seed after you for an everlasting possession. I can spend some time right there. Those who would say that Israel has no right to the land probably haven't read this particular contract, which is legal and binding. And he goes on and says, now your two sons, he's talking to Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you, they are mine. Just as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Verse 6, and your issue, which you get after them, will be yours and will be called after your name of the brothers in their inheritance. In other words, they'll, your, your children after these two will be in the inheritance, but you'll be last. They'll be last in the pecking order. When Joseph, or when Jacob said, this, these are mine, that they will be his just as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. What is he saying? Hands up. Frank says, by the laws that have been in place ever since the older biblical times, an adoptive child cannot be disowned unlike a natural born child. Correct. What else, Frank? <coughs> they cannot lose an inheritance. And at this point here, Jacob starts mixing up the pecking order. When Jacob made the statement, these two are mine, our, our translations don't get it. And we also don't get it because we don't understand the, the, the Eastern culture, the, the Middle Eastern culture, especially not at that time. When he said these are mine like Reuben and Simeon, he was basically saying Reuben and Simeon are out of here. These two are moving into their spot. So he was moving, as we'll see later on in chapter 48, he was moving Ephraim and Manasseh up to spots one and two. So that Ephraim was moving into the firstborn blessing. When he mixes up the pecking order, down in 14, Joseph was trying to change his dad's mind. Down in verse 14, we see, do you remember, Joseph took his sons to Jacob. Jacob says, bring them here. I want to bless them. Joseph set them up so that when they came up under Jacob's hands, Manasseh was here under the right hand. Ephraim was here under the left hand. Jacob crossed his hands and put Ephraim under his right hand. That's why we see Joseph trying to change that. That's what we see there in verse 14. Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the youngest one, and he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands, King James says, wittingly. In other words, he knew exactly what he was doing, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. And then he turned around, he blessed Joseph, and he said, this is now Jacob is talking to Joseph, God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God which fed me all my life long till this day, the angel, which redeemed me from all evil, he will bless the lads and let my listen, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. If we go back to verse four, where he says, "I will make you." God said, I will make you a multitude of people. The Hebrew there is Melo Hagoim. 
and that Hebrew phrase will occur again later on. I'll point it out to you. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it now. There have been a lot of disputes, wrong teachings, misunderstandings about what that means. And like I said earlier, we're going to we're going to cover that. We're going to look into those things. We're going to try to straighten some of those things out. So it's going to be important that y'all read too when you get to us, when we get to that place, so that we can work those things through. The point here is that Jacob is telling Joseph when he says in verse 16, <clears throat> let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude of the midst of the earth. In other words, Jacob was changing their name at that point. Before this, uh, like Ephraim would have been known as uh, Ephraim or Ephraim or Phil and I were talking about. How exactly do you pronounce it? Well, it depends on who you ask. But before this, Ephraim would have been known as Ephraim ben Yosef. Ephraim, the son of Joseph. Now, with what Jacob is saying, Ephraim's name has changed. He is now Ephraim ben Yaakov or Ephraim, the son of Jacob. They were serious. When Jacob said, these are mine, he meant they're mine. These are my kids. They are a part of my inheritance. And they will inherit all of my goods. And of course, in verse 17, Joseph saw that his dad crossed his hands up. And he tried to change that. Verse 18, in the King James, it has this very nice, discourse going on. Jacob said to his father, not so my father, for the firstborn is this one. Put your right hand on his head. What happened was is Joseph went, whoa, hold up. Dad, Dad, you got that messed up. And Jacob's response, again, this translation is all this nice speak. I doubt it. The, in, the interchange was Dad, you're messing up. And Jacob's response was, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. Because he had a reason behind that. As we were talking about earlier, before we got here, well, we'll get back to that in just a second. So anyway, verse 20. And he, he Jacob, he blessed them that day and said, in you, in these two, shall Israel do the blessing and say, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. And so he set Ephraim before Manasseh today, even today. In Jewish homes, in synagogues where children get blessed, when the fathers are blessing the sons from this, from this place, their statement is, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So even today, Hebrew fathers bless their sons this way. Why? What, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Why would they want to be like Ephraim and Manasseh and not like Abraham and Isaac? Good question. Frank, you got any ideas? Not on that end of it. But, <laughs> I, do, but I do know that what Yaakov was doing is exactly what happened with Isaac between him, between Yaakov and Esau. Why is, yeah. that? That is that the younger brother is getting the blessing of the older brother, which was rightfully stolen. Is that a way to say it? It was rightfully stolen. You mean when Jacob got the firstborn blessing? Yes. Right. It was rightfully stolen because Esau rightfully gave it away. And so here, what you have, though, is you have the father who is rightfully decided, because it's the father's prerogative to decide how to disperse it. And I would go back a little further than what Frank was saying, too. We go back to Abraham. Isaac was not the firstborn. Ishmael. Ishmael was the firstborn. But God said, Isaac, the second born. The apple of your eye. Yaakov. And God, also, yeah, and God also identified Isaac as the son of promise. And Yaakov was told what was going to happen. Yep. And Yosef is the apple of his eye. 
the firstborn of the loved wife. Yep. Or, excuse me, the beloved wife, because he did love Leah. So when we come back to the question, why would they bless their sons saying, may God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh, instead of, may God make you like Abraham and Isaac? Because Jacob put the blessings of Abraham and Isaac on these two. Yeah. He basically brought all that forward. He said, okay, everything that our patriarchs have is now on you. It was, it was a big deal. He mixed up the pecking order completely. He took Reuben and Simeon. He didn't take them out of the mix, but he put them at the bottom of the pecking order. They were number one and two. He took Ephraim and Manasseh and slid them up to one and two. And we'll see later on in Scripture, uh, primarily like in the Second Kings, Second Chronicles, and then the prophets' writings, we'll see Joseph's children. We'll also see the house of Israel referred to as the house of Joseph. As or Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, or Ephraim. So you have that that's going to go on because... When Jacob, Jacob blessed Ephraim, he passed the firstborn blessing to him, but there was more going on. Now, remember, Jacob didn't name Ephraim. Joseph named Ephraim. And yet we'll see exactly how it is that, again, God puts things into place the way that he wants them. Remember, Ephraim was jo Joseph's child, so he, Joseph named him. What we'll see in just a second is the way that this all fits together when we look at his name. There were consequences to this that were involved, like we talked about in the overview, the consequences to Reuben and Simeon's action, if you've been following your Torah portions. Reuben defiled his father's bed, which is why Jacob, when Jacob went to bless all of his sons, he pointed to Reuben and went, you're as stable as water. Think about that one. Duh. <laughs> in other words, I can't depend on you for nothing. Because Reuben took one of Jacob's concubines. That's a whole discussion we don't have time to get into. The bottom line was that Reuben stepped out of line. Simeon stepped out of line because of what him and Levi did to the men of Shechem who had raped their sister, who had raped Dina. And so they went, Levi and Simeon, pulled that deal. They said, let's just go over there to them and let's say we're going to cut a covenant with them and tell them that before we can cut a covenant with them, all the men have to be circumcised. So while all the dudes were sitting around with ice packs, Jacob and Simeon went through and killed all of them. I, to the last boy, killed all of them. Eradicated that seed. And as a result, Jacob went, now, you two are toast also. When we see in the blessings where Jacob talks about he's going to, how was it we read it this morning, he's going to disperse Levi and Simeon among the tribes. Yes. If you stop and think about it, you don't hear a lot about the tribe of Simeon later on. I mean, you, they're, you know, they're in the marching order when we get, when we leave Egypt and we see them mentioned there, they have their own area, they have their own space. But you don't hear a lot about it. Levi, who was actually the planner of the event, didn't get any land. And so Levi literally got scattered among all of the people of Israel. Now, granted, the Levitical tribe was the Levitical priesthood, but they still didn't have any land. They didn't have any inheritance. God was their inheritance. And as a result, they didn't have a place to live. They lived in all the different places. So there were consequences to those actions, and these two kids inherited, benefited from those consequences. Reuben was replaced, and so now that brings us to Ephraim, Ephraim, Ephraim. Who knows? I don't know. Depends on who you ask. Like a, like a friend of ours, Frank's ours too, of blessed memory, uh, Rabbi Dominic Zangler, a Sephardic Jew said he was in Israel and he wanted to know how to pronounce the ineffable name. And so he found a rabbi 
hotel where you're staying. And he went up to this rabbi, greeted him. He said, Rabbi, can I ask you a question? The rabbi said, certainly. He said, pronouncing the name, is it Yahweh or Yahweh? And the rabbi said, Yahweh. And Dominic said, thank you. And the rabbi said, you're welcome. <laughs> so it depends on who you ask. Ephraim, Ephraim, Ephraim. If you look at the Hebrew, it doesn't help. Because, again, it depends on who you ask. You can ask one rabbi, and he'll tell you it's Ephraim. You can ask another, like Frank, and he may say it's Ephraim. You may ask some sa Ephraim. sacred namer, and they, yeah, they'll never say Ephraim. But us Texas folks, it's just Ephraim. Ephraim. It means yeah. double portion or double fruit. <laughs> now remember, Joseph named his son. How was he supposed to know he was going to get a double portion? Now along comes Jacob, oh, wow. takes these two sons as his own, and moves this one to the top of the heap, says, you're mine, I'm changing your name right now. And so he was given this double portion. Not only that, but Ephraim's land, when they got into the promised land and started to, to break up the land and, and get, put the divisions out there, Ephraim's parcel was twice as big as anybody else's. And Ephraim himself, when we see that kingdoms split later on under the kings, you had the northern tribes, or the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, known as Ephraim, or Israel, was twice as big as the southern king, Judah. Everything Ephraim did, like everything he put his hand to, prospered. He was the double portion. It's a masculine form of the name of the word Ephratah. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Bethlehem. From the book of Bethlehem. Yeah, it's, the, the book of it's another name for the city of Bethlehem. It also means fruitfulness. So here's this kid named by his dad, Ephraim. He hadn't got a clue. Jacob takes him. His name means double portion. His name is also a masculine form of a city named Fruitfulness, which is the city of Bethlehem, which is the birthplace of our Messiah. Who can put that together except God? And it was all perfectly put together. I mean, just, the, I don't even want to get into it. John, you can probably figure odds better than I can. I'm not about to even get in the middle of that deal. I mean, what are the what are the possibilities of just that taking place? Um, let's just put a lot of zeros out there because that's probably the result. So we have Ephraim. This is what he means. He got the double portion. He's also referred to as Israel later in Scripture. Now, that's interesting that, remember I told you that Jacob basically was changing his name. What was Jacob's name changed to? Israel. Israel. Ephraim is the only son in the entire scripture from this point all the way to Malachi that you see occasionally referred to as Israel. Now, and, and that reference, by the way, is not just what the prophets write. It's when the prophets write, and God said to Israel... So it's God who referred to Ephraim as Israel under his father's name. The northern kingdom was known as Israel. So you had these two kingdoms. This is, I just find this just, got to get back on track, but this is just fascinating to me. So you had this lad who gets identified as Israel, as, as his, if you'll roll with me, he gets identified as his father, Jacob. Remember Jacob? He's mine. So he gets identified as his father to the point that he's got his name. So you have the house of Israel, and this is confusing, or the house of Joseph, or the house of Ephraim. All three of those are the same individual. And then you have, in Scripture, what's referred to as the whole house of Israel. 
which means not only just the northern kingdom, but all of the tribes of Israel. And yet, he's the only one that's referred to as Israel. Remember? Double portion. He's walking in his dad's blessings. Not only his dad's blessings, but the blessings of Abraham and Isaac. So there's a lot going on here. There's much more to be said about Ephraim. We just talked about that. He was named Israel because he assumed the role of the firstborn. There will be more later, not today. Ephraim is an entire study. We can and we can and we will. John, I was telling the other folks that our, our our plan for the year ahead is to just do some general teaching stuff. I'll get to your question. In case y'all didn't know, oh, is the topic box back there? It's not. We usually have a topic box back there. So if you have a topic you want us to cover, we maybe we'll put that out there. And they can email it too. Yeah, we can email it. Then you know you send it to us and we'll work that in. Well, my my topic to be covered person is sitting right over here. I can always depend on him to come up with topics. Something. <laughs> why does or who is He's the topic? Or why does who is? What, how did that happen? That's my brother John. But that's okay because we those are things that need to be looked at. They those are questions that need to be answered. And so in the coming year, we're going to try to answer those questions and some other things. So Ephraim, we will talk about later, probably sooner than too much later, because I don't want it to get away from you. So that's about Ephraim. And now we get to the last verse. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. It is tradition when you finish a book that the person that's reading the last verse reads the last verse with sort of a flourish, and then everybody in the congregation, including, including y'all, would say, right. Frank's saying it, John's going, rrr, 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 rrr. Yeah. You're close. That's good, John. Hazak, Hazak, Vani, Hazek, which means be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. And this traditionally is said because you have just finished a book in the Torah. And it's an encouragement to be strong and read the next book. Keep going. <laughs> Don't quit. Yes. But it's also just an encouragement in trust that God will take care of us. So we're going to back up. Not that far. Uh oh. One notch. I'm going to read this. Then I'm going to click the button. And then we all get a chance to say that blessing together. Okay, that's right, John. Woohoo. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they abolished him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Hazak, Hazak, Vanit Hazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. Maybe you should say each word independently. Let us repeat it. Let me like Chazak. 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 Benit. Benit. Chazek. Chazek. And it all flows together with Chazak, Chazak, Benit, Chazek. And we're going to study this one. Remember when we did our word of the week? I told you we weren't done yet. I warned you. You had fair warning. Deuteronomy 31, numbers one. <laughs> So I see y'all writing it down. So we'll let everybody write, get that written down. Everybody has it written down, so let's move forward. All right. So another word for the week. Here we go. That's the Hebrew. You may try to write that down if you choose to or not. It's pronounced chazak. Remember the C-H underline is the clearing your throat. We just looked at some of it, but it's we translated it in the last phrase as be strong. Now, what do we know about Hebrew? There's more to it than that. It's not just be strong. It's to be sure. It's also to be strong, as we just found out. And literally, it means to fasten upon something, to seize on it. 
how can that equate to being strong? Grab hold, get a hold of it, hang, hang on to it. If, if Frank and I are rolling in the mud because we had words with each other, one of us is going to be stronger than the other one. So when Frank has seized upon my throat and has me in the dirt, he's the strongest in the, in the pile at that point. So fastening upon, I, keep, I want you to get hold of the whole fastening upon the, the seizing something that, that what John just indicated, get, get, really get a hold of something. If you want to keep something, if it's mine, it's mine. And I'm hanging on to it. That's the idea behind this. You be, you be strong. Be sure. I have a hold of God's word. It is mine, and I'm not turning it loose. I'm strong in that fact. Now, thought it was over. Yep, one more word of the week. This one is amats. Mm. A H M A T M A H T Z amats. Aleph Mem Zadi. Yep, Aleph Mem Zadi. You could say Zadi Sophie. Zadi Sophie. And it means to be alert or to be steadfast. Excuse me, to harden yourself. Now, this is going to spend time right here, right quick. I want you to remember this because when we get ahead into the book of Exodus and we see all those times that there's a reference to heart, Pharaoh's heart being hardened. It's this word. Mm -hmm. And and we'll get there. We're not going to spend time here. But newsflash, this is not something somebody can do to you. Which is going to bring up the whole question. Wait a minute. God said he would harden Pharaoh's heart. Well, you can't, you can't do this to somebody. Not even God. You can't do this to somebody. Yourself. It's harden yourself. So if, did you know I can harden her heart? If I do the wrong things often enough, eventually she will resent me. I haven't, I didn't do, I didn't make her heart hard. Physically, I did not grab her heart, make it hard. But my actions did make her heart hard. With me? That's what God did with Pharaoh. All those events started taking place. Remember, okay, we're going to take a side road, rabbi trail. All those things that, that Pharaoh did, when he was going after the gods of Egypt. Pharaoh himself was considered to be a god. And so with each step, when Pharaoh saw one of his gods knuckle under, crumble like dust, he would get angry. Eventually, his heart was hardened. It was a mox. So that's also what this means, but it's to be steadfast or alert or to be obstinate. And we saw that in Pharaoh. But we're going to see this word in a minute, we're going to look at it. And I want you to remember the concept of obstinate and steadfast. Remember those two concepts when we look at this word later, because it's important for where we're going. We'll talk about the courage commandments right quick. Now, I got here because we did the chazak encouragement at the end of Genesis. Joshua 1.6 says, be strong, which is what? Chazak. Be strong and of a good Very. mox. mox. Okay. What does a mox mean? Obstinate, alert. Chazak is to seize upon something. That's what God is telling Joshua. It's what he's telling us. For to this people shall you divide an inheritance in the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. That's specifically to Joshua. These other exhortations are to us. Only be strong 
and very courageous. Be chazak and be very amatz. That you may observe to do according to all the law, the Torah, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Uh, uh oh. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Let's talk prosperity gospel for a second. Can we? Then okay, we go there. Now I believe that God wants to prosper his people. Understand that. I do. But there's a caveat. You want to walk in this, you may prosper wherever you go. You want to walk in this, then you've got to walk in that. Observe to do according to the Torah. Law is a bad translation. Any translation that says law is a bad translation because the Torah is not law. The Torah is not speed limits. And uh, criminal law, it is God's teaching and instruction for his people. The last time I checked, y'all heard me say this before, I keep hammering home because it's important. I don't think enough of us get it. If we are following Messiah Yeshua, then we have identified as the people of God. And this is for us. Now, there are some people, let me just go down this road. I was going to do it later, but now is as good a time as any. Good friends of ours. Father, help me. I used to teach it. Who have a, it's known as a dual covenant mentality that says that there's the church and there's Israel. And Israel's program, if you will, this, is not for the church. There's a church program and there's Israel's program. But the problem is found in Ephesians. Where Paul says, you, us, were once foreigners and strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. But now, through Yeshua Messiah, you, us, have been brought near and made fellow citizens of the commonwealth of all the covenants. And last time I checked, this is part of all of the covenants. So those folks that would tell you that that's for Israel, uh, how can I put this, Frank, gently? They're wrong. That's about as gentle. That's about as gentle as the bulls kick. Right. I mean, that's about as gentle as you can get with. It. All right. So anyway, I'm sorry. I just kind of got off track there because, again, if we want to walk in God's blessings. There are. I don't want to. I, I hesitate to use the word conditions, although that's. I mean, that is the that is the deal. He promises to bless us. Yeah. If. Yeah. It's like we 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 are the F from. We are the Ephraim and uh, Manasseh. Yep. We are the adopted. Yep. We are the grafted. When I was coming up, my dad had a certain program for me. As long as I stayed inside that box, if you will, life was good. When I stepped outside that box, life was not so good. It's my fault every time. So when we see situations going bad in our lives, and let me just stop here for a second, because Jen, I know that you're you're new to this. When we make that decision, no. When we have the revelation, when it really comes alive in our hearts, that Torah is for us. Not against us. There's no going back. Can I add? Sure. I would like to add, obedience leads to blessing. Always. Every time. Mm -hmm. Every time. 30, 28. Yep. All right. So let's keep, let's keep reading. All right. I lost my train of thought. No, I didn't. I just got, got off track for a second. All right. So in the verse 7, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law, this Torah, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, just like John said, if, then, 
For then you shall make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. When? When you're walking in the Torah. Have I not commanded you? Be, here we go again, be chazek. Be strong. Be, seize upon it. And be of good amats. Be obstinate about it. Be secure in it. Do not be afraid. Neither be dismayed, for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. If we know the king of the universe is with us wherever we go, and what are we afraid of? Absolutely. Just saying. Is that arrogance? No. It's his promise. We just expect to walk in it. That's a surety. He's the one who's promised us these things. You have daughters. If you have promised your daughter a certain thing, she gets that just because she's your daughter, not for any other reason. She didn't have to perform for that. Why would we think our Heavenly Father is any different? These, this, is, this is his box. These are, quote, the house rules. You obey the house rules, you're good. And then we can expect to be prosperous in everything that we do. He has commanded us. He's going to promise us good success. This is the end of this particular teaching on, quote, the prosperity gospel. There is a lot of trouble with that theology, and we're going to, we're going to dig way deep into that sometime later because there are verses that people cannot ignore when it comes to those who say there's no such thing. And there are also verses that you cannot ignore when it comes to those who say God's going to give you a Cadillac. So there's a, again, y'all know where I stand. Walking in the Torah is the hard line middle of the road. When Yeshua said the broad path leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to salvation. We have been taught, especially in the evangelical church, as two separate roads. <clears throat> Thanks for playing. <laughs> it's the same road. Same road. Because you can get off track on this broad path with theologies, whether it's super fundamentalism on the right or super liberalism on the left. And in the middle is where God's Torah lies. And it's actually pretty easy to, to walk. All right, won't charge anything for that. So how do we demonstrate strength and courage? Sometimes we have to wait. And the problem with that is sometimes we don't want to. But we see folks that waited. Abraham, we know he waited. Abraham waited how long for the promise of Isaac? 100 years, 99 years. 100 years. Man, Joseph had to wait to see his favorite son's status. Now, he didn't wait 100 years, but the time that he had to wait involved prison. You don't think it was hard for him to keep his mind on the fact that he was a favored son or to keep his mind on the fact that God was with him? Scripture tells us God was with him in that prison environment. But he still had to wait. Zechariah, and I'm talking about the one that we read about in the Gospels, who was in Luke 3. You read his account, I think it is. He and Elizabeth were childless. They were both well up in years. They'd been praying for a child. They were waiting. One day Gabriel shows up and tells Zechariah, y'all are going to have a kid. And it surprised him so much, Gabriel had to shut his mouth so he wouldn't ruin the deal. Because he kept blabbing his suit cooler. How can that be? I'm old and Elizabeth, have you seen her? I mean, there went, gotcha. Zip. You're done. Till the child is done, you're done. But he still had to wait. And what about Simeon, who had served the Lord for many years in the temple because God had promised him that his days would not end until he saw the Messiah. And he prophesied in that moment when Mary gave him the child, 
He knew, he knew who he was. But he had to wait. And sometimes if they waited, why would we think that sometimes we don't wait? And we don't like the idea of waiting. Why? It takes us out of the driver's seat. News flash. Yeah, that's good. We've never been in the driver's seat. It makes us think you're out of your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. You're never in control of things. Ask Frank to repeat that. What'd you say, Frank? If God if God is in the if if you're in the driver's seat or if you're in the uh, pilot seat, you're in the wrong seat. That's right. If you're in the final seat, you're in the wrong seat. Exactly correct. But this is because we're human, because we're still dealing with this earth suit. When we have to wait, when we think we're losing control, it bothers us. If you say it doesn't bother you, well, let's just say when we finish up, we're going to pray for liars later on. Okay. <laughs> because we all have that issue. The Lord's still trying to work that out of all of us. It's a, it's a C word. A C word? Control. Control. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well, you know, because women understand that word. <laughs> right. Waiting means we sometimes put our reputation on the line. John, do you really think God's going to do that? You know, it's been two years now. Nothing's happened. Oops. Whose reputation is really on the line? Ours or God's? God's reputation is on the line. We're his representatives in the earth. If I can't trust the boss to take care of issues, then he's really not worth my time. But trusting him, if everything else fails, go back to rule one, means I may have to wait. May take a while for it, whatever it is to come to pass. And it may mean that I can stand in the middle of the deal with pressure from this side to give in and pressure from this side to not give in. And then, of course, I'm dealing with my own headspace, which is going to be doing flip-flops, trying to make up my mind which way I'm going to go. That's why, remember what we studied, be strong and have a good courage. Kazakh in a month. I have to seize upon something and be obstinate in it. Waiting means we fasten onto we chazak. Our trust in God and obstinately wait for him to show up no matter what that deal is. I'm thinking personally right now that there's an election that's being dealt with. Some people say it's over. Some people say it isn't. Some people say that God has a covenant with this country. Some people don't. Some people don't know the history of this country. Just saying. Yeah. There is a covenant with this country. I'm not getting into politics. I'm just telling you the way to deal with it. I don't care what your political leanings are. I only care what his political leanings are, and he don't have any. But if we think for one second that it's God's will that baby murderers be in charge of this office and start charging this country and start passing that sort of legislation, we are wrong, dead wrong. And God is the king, he is Period. the lawgiver, and he is the judge. And he's the judge. Thank you. I remember reading that this morning. So anyway, we have, we, we've got to obstinately hang on. And, that, that, and again, let me put our reputation on the line. There are folks out there right now who are willing to put everything on the line and stand for what they believe in. That's my end on the whole politics thing, but we have upstairs talked about how the day is coming when we are also going to have to put everything on the line. Everything on the line. And it may cost us a bunch. It may cost us everything. It may cost us everything. Thank you, Michael. Which brings us to Ephesians 6, and verse 13. This is from the King James Version. Wherefore, take to you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, when, whenever that day is. And having done all, to stand. Just standing. Did you know if who's whose armor is it? God's armor. Golly. Did you know? Did you know that God's armor doesn't fit you? It's a whole bunch bigger than you are, because it's his armor. 
Well, here's the other side of that coin. If I'm wearing his armor, do you know the adversary doesn't know who's in there? All he sees is God's armor walking down the street. Who's that? I don't know if I want to mess with that or not. But I've got to wear it like it means something. And the big thing about what Paul writes to us is the whole thing about having done, when, you, when you've done everything, when you've stood all you can stand, stand there some more. Joseph stood in prison, and as a result, he was made number two guy in all of Egypt because he stood, refused to give up what he knew God had in mind for him. If we look at Daniel, you know the whole deal. Daniel in the lion's den because Daniel refused to eat the king's goodies. He refused to stop praying. He refused to quit facing east. And as a result, there were folks who didn't like the fact that Daniel couldn't be controlled who came after him and put him in the lion's den where he cuddled up next to one of those furry creatures and took a nap because God was with him. And he knew God was with him. But it didn't matter to Daniel, just like it didn't matter to the three Hebrew children. No matter what, Daniel was not going to knuckle under. Remember what the three Hebrew children said. We know that our God is able to save us, and he will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bound. We're not playing this idle game. For us to make a stand in the days ahead, regardless who sits in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, it's going to be a big deal because it's going to require something of us. Waiting is not static. What part is? What are you doing, Dan? I'm waiting. I'm just hanging out, waiting. Look like you wait for your nose. No. Biblical waiting is not static. It's not hanging around in your chair. Biblical waiting requires action. It requires us to be obstinate. Biblical waiting means this. I'm waiting for it. It's coming. Michael, it's coming. And I'm ready for it. I'm anticipating it. Which brings us to finally our last word of the week. I thought y'all thought we were done. <laughs> and this last word is have. And it means bind together by twisting or braiding. It also means to expect or to look forward with assurance. It's one thing to look forward to something, but if I know it's coming, then I can look forward to it in high expectation. But how does binding together by twisting or braiding, how does that work? How does that become expecting something? I'm open. How does... Binding together by twisting or braiding become look forward to something with assurance. To, uh, to tie your to tie your ox cart to the to the uh, what's the right to the to the right team. Tie your ox cart to the right team. I like it. I like it. You're you're. You're still, you're expecting. So I, let's go with that. Let's go with that. Or let's go with something. My brother Frank was in the Navy. Now, Frank was not a knuckle dragon boatswain's mate. He was an engine. Well, not much. I was <laughs> when they tie up those huge ships, they have what they call, the large ones are called cables or lines, Frank? Lines. Lines. They have, they have lines that they tie, to tie them up with, and these things are huge. When it's just braided rope is all it is, but you know that sucker's not going to break. There is an expectation that that ship's going to stay at the dock because it's tied there with that rope. I would submit 
let's use the card. This is the cart I have tied my oxen to. And I'm not turning loose of this. And so as a result of binding this, remember, Kazakh, I'm going to get a hold of this. As a result of binding this to myself, I can look forward with a shirt because I know that this is true. We see Chave used in biblical waiting. And we're going to get there in just a second. Biblical waiting brings a blessing. Remember, we talked about biblical waiting is not sitting in a chair. It's an idea of, you know, they got a, there's a phrase today called the leaning in. I don't know where that came from, but in this regard, okay, maybe it works. Because we're, you, again, I know, I know Frank saw it because we both have our time in the service. But there was this, <laughs> when, when you got a bunch of people together in the gaggle, and you're trying to teach them how to march. When the drill instructor would go, you'd, they'd, here, they're, here they stand, and the drill instructor would say, forward, and you could see them go. Because they're waiting for march. And many times, my drill instructor would just stand there and wait until somebody went. And then he had them. But that was an anticipation. It, that was the ultimate leaning in. I'm, I know it's coming. I've already been given the preparatory command. I know it's coming. I'm just waiting for it. Biblical waiting, that type of waiting, comes with a blessing. Psalm 24, 27 and verse 14. I encourage you to circle this in your Bible, write it down, make a note, whatever. Wait on Adonai. Remember, wait Wait on Adonai. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Adonai. Let's look at that in the Hebrew. There it is. But y'all knew that. Y'all knew that. Kaveh, El Yahweh, Chazak, Vayaametz, Lebecha, Uv. Kove el Adonai. Wait on Adonai. Kave. That was our Hebrew word. To wait in anticipation. To bind the rope together. To bind your cable to something. Okay? Be of good courage. Hazak. Remember what we learned about that word? It was that idea of seizing upon something. And he will strengthen you. You cannot strengthen your own heart. You have to have something else going on in order to strengthen your heart. Having, having seen combat, you cannot strengthen your own heart. No. You have to make a determination to simply move forward. And as you move forward, your psyche becomes developed to what you're doing. In God's case, if we wait on him, remember... Wait. We don't have any reason to lose hope. Be of good courage. Hazak sees upon, and it's he who will bring strength, abets that strength issue to your heart. That's Lebeka. And then the verse, the Psalm verse finishes off with, so wait on Adonai. Wait, so wait on Adonai. And I want to. I want to teach you a little Hebrew phrase. We're going to look at the first part of this verse because this, if you commit this verse to your memory, Michael? Well, I was just looking at the word Adonai. Is it that? It is. Okay, well, they it it also? Okay. Yep. I just put Adonai. Okay. But you're correct. It's Yahweh. There may be folks who watch later who would be. We might take issue with that, so I use the, this is known as a I forgot the word. You mean for the tetragrammaton? The tetragrammaton. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a replacement for the tetragram. It's it's Hebrew for my master. The master of me, which he is. Okay. So anyway, I highly encourage you to commit this verse to memory. 
No matter what goes on, lean on this one. Wait on this verse. And remember what we looked at here and what we're going to look at with the Hebrew, okay? And this is the portion I want us to learn. And I'm going to try to teach it to you. It's Kaveh El Adonai. Hazak Vaya Amet Labeka. We've already seen. This means wait on Yahweh. Wait on the Lord. Be strong. And he, and he will strengthen your heart. It's Kaveh El Adonai Hazak Vaya Amet Libeka. Kaveh El Adonai Chazak, Vya Amitz Libeka. This will be on the obviously will be on the tape. If you and I don't ask me why. I, I cannot explain this. I can. But if you learn a few phrases that you commit to yourself in the original language, I'm Again, I there's no I have no scientific explanation for this. All I know is that somehow it's like the spirit of God works on our hearts. It's like when you hear that for the first time and your heart leaps, you can't explain that. But it's the sound of God speaking to your heart. If you learn Hebrew phrases, or just a few, and commit them to your heart somehow or another in your heart. When you remember those phrases, something goes off in there. One of the ones that took me through many years is Hamilchemala Yahweh, which means the battle is the Lord's. Amen. What verse of Psalms is that? This is Psalm 27, 14. Is that right? Did I just tell her right? Yep. Yeah, 2714. You want to whoever would like to have this, I will send it, I'll send it to you in an email. I'll I'll take this, I'll take a snapshot of this guy and send it to you so you can study it, so you can so you can make this yours. I dare say that in those moments of difficulty, if you can bring this one up in your spirit. And just tell it to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud. Just tell it to yourself. Your heart, there's something that will take place in your heart. Because God has promised that it is He who will strengthen your heart. It is He who will do the amends. That will put you in that place of obstinacy where you will not be moved. Yep. Frank has his hand raised. What's Frank got? If you want a, if you want a very simple way to remember... 27, 14. Okay. Is the same way we say Hasak, Hasak, unique Hasak. Uh huh. Keve, Hasak, Keve. Okay. The first three words. For the words of each line. Yeah. Keve, Hasak. Wait. Yeah. You know, yeah. Wait. And that'll bring, that'll at least bring the verse to mind. So anyway, you know, email us if you want this. Let us know. We'll we'll get it to you because it's important. I don't mind taking that extra step because this is important because the day is coming. We're going to need those kind of things. Remember, quick lesson. We just came out of Hanukkah, and there's a game that's played at Hanukkah called the dreidel game. Yay. <laughs> Do you know why the dreidel was invented? Kind of, so they can hide the word yeah. in your heart. Because the letters on the dreidel stand for the Hebrew words that say a great miracle happened here. And so the children, because at that time, the dreidel's not that old, really. And it was at a time when having a Torah or teaching your children about Torah was against the law. And this was a way for the Jewish people to keep the word of God in their children, playing the dreidel game. Okay. So that when the dreidel fell and there was a letter there, 
the children were to remember what what that word was. And it's a it's kind of a, I, I call it a betting game because it's you usually you're, you're betting like you know chocolates or buttons or little kid coins or whatever like that. It's just a game to play. Certain letters turn up. You do certain things with the the items that are in the pot. But the big thing was is that when the letter turned up, you gave a word that started with that letter from the toe, which meant that you were also giving a letter that started with that a word that started with that letter in the Hebrew, which kept the Hebrew language alive. So those little things like that become important, like this becomes important. There may become a time when, like in the dark ages, the word of God as we know it, don't doubt this, don't think it can't happen, may actually be seized and locked away. Like that, the church in New Mexico we heard about this morning. Oh, yeah, like the church, church, some of the churches in New Mexico. Good point, yeah. Who the governor of New Mexico find, find these churches $10,000, $10,000 each because they met. During this COVID time. Yeah, during this, during this time. $10,000 because a church met. Wait a minute, what happened to the First Amendment? I thought the Supreme Court had already struck down. They can't, they can't do that. In another they state just they did, did it. And they, well, they did it in New York, I think. But no, New York, New York didn't resort to that sort of thing. But New Mexico's governor did that. So I'm hopeful, that's what I'm praying, that all those churches will gang, get together and bring a lawsuit and beat the wheels off of that governor in court. Because, again, don't, don't think that this other thing can't happen. 1939 Germany. Yep. Book burning. 35. Portland, Oregon. Last year. Book burning. Last night. All right. So... Don't, don't think it can't happen. And as a result, the only word that you will have is what you have in your heart. And that's what will mean things to you. I just bring that up just so we understand the seriousness of the time frame we could be entering. Final thoughts. Walking as a favorite child can be difficult. We just kind of, <coughs> kind of covered it. It definitely can be. Strength can be found in the waiting period. Hazan by Ametz. Remember those. Courage must be decided on. Remember we talked about how I can't change your heart. I can't give you courage. God has promised he will do that. If, Psalm 27, 14, if we wait, we wait on him. I'll send you this one if you like it because I think it was kind of neat. If you fully, in, if you intend to fully live, haya, you must be strong, hazak, and exercise courage, amats, while you wait, kave. You just remember those words if you want to. If you intend to fully live, I'm not talking about just existing. Someone that Carol and I really enjoy talks about how people contact him and say, well, you know, I, I just can't, whatever. We were actually talking about this in Israel. I really want to go, but I'm not going to go until it's safe. Then you'll never go. Never go. Because it's never going to be perfectly safe. Ah, Michael, I just can't go worship anymore because I you know, you know what's going on. I can't be around other people. It's never going to be perfectly safe, ever. And this thing that they've got in the vials is not going to keep you perfectly safe. It's already mutated. Florida's already seen the first mutation of the COVID. Now they call it COVID B, I think it is, because the thing that got here is already mutated. Well, the vaccine's no good for that. So who do we trust? That's right. We trust. The king. It's never going to be completely safe. And as long as we're following Yeshua Messiah,
it may become less and less safe for us. We need to get that in our brain housing group and get hold of that fact. If we have never seen that type of persecution here, but it may be coming because it's certainly happening overseas. We are not in this to be popular or to get along. We are in this to occupy until he comes. Yes. And the occupation force must abide by the rules of the commander in chief, not by the rules of the area where they are in occupation. I don't always like to use those type of military terms, but we are the army of the most high. And we need to start understanding some of those terms. This is not a game. It's not, can't we just get along? It's not that. Because the gospel brings offense. It just will. Doesn't mean we have to operate in arrogance or brutality. We need to operate with compassion and grace. But we have to operate. Can't sit in the chair waiting. Lastly, I was going to talk more about us, but we've kind of been all around that. We have a decision to make about what we're going to do in the days ahead. Be strong, banish fear and doubt. Remember, the Lord is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 9, Shabbat Shalom. Father, we have looked at, covered the things that I think you wanted us to look at. As always, we ask that the ground that the seed fell on will be fertile ground, that it will spring up into a full harvest. Strengthen us, Father, chazak us. Bring that courage, the, the amats to our lives that gives us the boldness to stand after we've done everything we know to do. Help us to remember that it's your armor that we wear, not our own. And that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. To pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and calling into subjection every thought it would raise itself against your purposes. We bless you and magnify you, sir. We ask you to go with us now as you always do. Bring us back again safely for another opportunity to, to, to just dig into your word and consume it. Thank you for everybody who has joined us, whether it's here, whether they're online now, or whether they'll see the video later. We bless you for them, and we ask you to bless them houses that they represent. We pretend, present these petitions before you in that name that is above every name, the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Let us oh, God, God commanded this in the book of Numbers. Blessing. Mike is ready to go. He's probably thinking about Judah. Ibaraka Kaya wave a Ishbareka, Ye area wave Panabaleka, Vikuneka, Ye Sahaya wave Panabaleka, Visenleka, Shalom. Now may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his shalom. Hashem Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, our Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. We're all sealed by the Holy Spirit. The name of Yahweh is on each and every one of us. So Shabbat shalom. Thanks for joining us. We'll See meet again time. on the 23rd. That's right. January 23rd, 23rd. y'all.